So the FAA just came out with its report on the UTM or the Unmanned Traffic Management System. I'm going to go through this step by step, see what's in here, and then I'm going to compare it with the Remote ID NPRM that came out earlier this year and see if it truly spells the end of the hobbyist pilot. So this is Keith and this is Alien Drones. Thanks for stopping by, I always appreciate it. It's really good to see you. If this is your first time here, I do mostly drone tech, photography, tips and tutorials, and industry news. And if this is something that's of interest to you, you may want to consider hitting the subscribe button. That will let you know if there's future content that might be of interest to you. So let's get right into the UTM, the Unmanned Traffic Management System and talk a little bit about what it is. So I'm gonna go through just a few items and it's gonna look like this. First, I'm gonna start out with what is UTM? Why is it important to us? The evolution, because the FAA has actually been working on this for a few years. Uh, what the heck is a volume reservation? And that's a term you're really gonna to wanna to be familiar with because this is the one that's gonna get us as hobbyists. What about uh, beyond visual line of sight and visual line of sight operations? How do they differ and who's gonna get priority if that happens? The performance authorization, and this is gonna be about who's gonna be qualified to do what types of operations. The remote identification that we talked about in the NPRM, uh, how this finally ties into this UTM and the entire scenario that the FAA is trying to establish, and equity, and equity is going to be who gets the airspace if it's full or there's a priority operation going on? Is a hobbyist going to be first in line or is Amazon going to deliver your tube socks? And then lastly, I'm going to summarize it just so you can see what it's like. Also, it's important that you take a look at the remote ID video I did. I'll put that link up here for you because that's going to give you a baseline for where all this UTM is coming from. At the time when the remote ID came out, it was kind of a surprise to most people and it seemed like a really overreaching scenario going from nothing or just having the link or self-declaring uh, where you're going to be in the airspace to a full-fledged remote ID, full-time monitoring of all your information where your drone is in the sky and where you are on the ground and your flight plan and what you're doing. Uh, so now this ties it together a little more uh, with the UTM, why the remote ID is so important. So let's just jump right into it. So what is UTM, Unmanned Traffic Management? Well, the UTM is defined as the manner which the FAA will support operations for UAS operating in low altitude airspace. Now that's important. Low altitude airspace means 400 feet or below typically. So this is where the UAVs are gonna operate. Not only us as hobbyists, but 107 pilots and commercial with regard to UPS, Amazon, delivery services, fire, search and rescue. Everybody that wants to have a UAV is going to want to fly in this airspace. So the UTM is what the FAA has come up with to try to manage traffic in all airspace, not just controlled airspace like it does now with the LANC. So the UTM in a nutshell is LANC for every bit of airspace out there. So the FAA really doesn't know what's going on in the uncontrolled airspace at the moment. It really wasn't that important. There were some hobbyists, some photographers, maybe some people uh, doing real estate photos, things like that, some light commercial work. But now with the explosion of the UAVs, everybody wants a piece of this new uncontrolled airspace. Now the key with this system is the FAA wants to control traffic in all airspace, not just controlled, but uncontrolled. And they simply can't do it. There is not the infrastructure in place to control every single mile of airspace across the United States. So this is truly an evolution. This is not something new. The FAA has been testing this for about four years now. And really, it looks pretty good. So the FAA has taken this data real time and put it together in such a way that while you're flying the UAV or a manned pilot or a pilot of another commercial system can be advised that there's traffic in the area. Now, the important thing with that is this is the volume reservation you'll hear talked about. Consider a volume of space that goes up in a column and over in airspace. Now, this is the way they're going to identify routes, for instance, coming from a, an Amazon or UPS delivery system. 
could be the airspace right over your house. So the reason that the FAA thought that this was really important is because they see an explosion of use in the UAVs, whether it's for deliveries, whether it's for emergency services or things like that, for recreational pilots. And they need a way when the airspace is full to determine where everybody is and to make sure that there's no collisions. It comes down to that. Then they're going to prioritize who will have the best use of the airspace. Now, eventually, I see a time when you're going to need to pay for the access to that, just like you would on a toll road, because somebody's going to have to pay. It always is the money sometime. So this is why it's important when you actually make a flight plan that you don't deviate from that plan. Any deviation is going to be caught by the remote ID and show an alarm that you're not in the volume of airspace that you rented. Now, this is where I think it's going to be difficult for a hobbyist UAV pilot to actually just go out and fly. Now think about it, you take your Mavic out, it's a beautiful day, you want to take some pictures of a sunset, you're just not going to be able to do that anymore. You're going to need to know what volume of airspace that is occupied already, what is planned, and actually reserve your own piece of this airspace through volume reservations. If you don't do this, and anybody sees that there's a UAV in the sky, whether it's broadcasting because the new manufacturers are broadcasting something, or a member of the general public scans because they see a UAV in the sky and they're gonna be instructed to look it up. And if it doesn't present with a flight plan and who you are and where you're going, they're going to consider you rogue. If they consider you rogue, they are going to notify everybody, including the local police for an investigation and directly to the FAA. This means that unlike before, where you could fly anonymously and just land, somebody's going to know and they're gonna come knock on your door. Now, previously the FAA never had this type of authority because they didn't have the bandwidth to come knock on your door if you were in violation of some FAA regulation. However, with this new community-based scenario where the general public can capture your information, transmit it to the local authorities, who can transmit it uh, to the FAA and start an investigation. It closes the loop between you just flying a UAV in your backyard, or if you're a fixed wing pilot, flying your plane in an area which is not a designated area, you will be singled out for potential fines and penalties. So this is how they're gonna close this loop which they never had closed before. So this is why they're pushing so hard for the remote identification. We'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. So here's the reason the FAA wants this plan implemented, and I believe they will get it. Beyond Visual Line of Sight, BVLOS. If you're not sure what that means, it is just like it sounds, flights beyond visual line of sight. Now as a hobbyist, when you or I fly a UAV or a fixed wing RC aircraft, we always have the aircraft in visual line of sight. Now this is really important because historically it allows us to make decisions based on the environment around us. Do we see an emergency helicopter coming? Do we see other things coming like weather, uh, a manned aircraft that's coming through? We can adjust and make decisions based on uh, the factors at the time. Now the beyond visual line of sight doesn't have that opportunity. They're not watching this real time in full spatial awareness. They have no idea what's coming up behind them, on the sides of them. They file the plan and this thing is just going autonomous. So as this UAV continues without having line of sight, it has no spatial awareness whatsoever unless everything around it is transmitting in such a way that they can see on a computer screen in some remote office what is going on real time. Of course, if something pops up, emergency vehicle, a manned aircraft comes in the way, another UAV, just a hobbyist pops up, gonna take some pictures in this 400 feet of airspace. That's gonna be a problem for a completely autonomous piece of equipment. It is going to crash. And in the best interest of people on the ground, and of course of the interest who are going to pay to use this airspace, mainly UPS, Amazon, and all the big delivery services, nobody wants that to happen. So this is why the requirement is going to be put in place. Now it is at the peril of a hobbyist because it is going to be expensive. Somebody's going to have to run all this real-time data. They're going to have to watch. They're going to have to report things to the local police, the FAA. They're gonna to have to watch when an emergency comes up and notify people. And you FPV guys out there, of course, we can't have that in the airspace because if there is a collision or somebody has to actually deviate from their plan, uh, it's gonna cost somebody some money. And it always seems to come down to the money. And when it comes down to the money and it comes down to Joe Schmo hobbyist, or keys from alien drones taking a picture of a landscape, 
or a guy with an RC flying over his fields uh, doing some crop surveys or just for fun, you and I are going to lose. Whatever that case might be, we are going to lose. And you know it. Uh, when it comes up to these big players, there's going to be a rule, a regulation, a fine, a penalty, something that's going to keep us out of the way. So the next piece is going to be the performance authorization. It's going to qualify you as a pilot to make sure that you're capable of operating this UAV in such a manner that complies with the rules and regulations that they set forth. And also it's going to make sure that your UAV is going to comply with the structure that's already in place whether that be remote ID, whether it be transmitting, whether it be a flight plan, whatever it might be to meet the airspace needs at that time. Again, if you think the FPV you've built in your garage is going to pass that, I doubt it. So I believe this is one of the ways they're going to filter out the hobbyists from the airspace is by saying, well, you don't either qualify or your aircraft is not uh, permissible in the airspace. So you certainly can fly for the meantime, but you're just going to need to do it in a fixed site. So, of course, the next piece is the remote ID. Now it becomes very clear why the remote ID and PRM came out the way it did and was so strict. It must be to meet the criteria of the unmanned traffic management system. Without very detailed remote ID requirements that go throughout the industry and the USS, not a remote ID transmission from a drone to see where another UAV might be, that's not good enough. Of course, with this full-fledged airspace coverage that the FAA wants to do, they need a very detailed remote ID. So this is where it plays in. Now, I'm not going to go into the remote ID details uh, because in that video that I mentioned before that was up here, I did go through the actual details of the remote ID, what characteristics, what uh, data streams, what information was going to be in the data set, all that kind of stuff. So I'm not gonna go through it again. Just understand that without the remote ID, this entire plan falls apart. So all of us that took the time to submit our thoughtful comments to the FAA regarding the remote ID and PRM, I'm afraid that was already a foregone conclusion. Now, maybe they'll trim it around the edges a little bit and uh, dust a few things off to try to appease people. But without that remote ID, the UTM is not going to work. And that is the plan. But just know for the purposes of this video, that the remote ID is gonna be required on all future uh, UAVs in the uh, US airspace and probably gonna propagate around the world, I would imagine. Uh, and this is going to be a requirement of, of the manufacturers to put in. And if it does not, uh, they're gonna tag you, they're going to search you down as a rogue and say it's a terrorist or something like that. Uh, so it's going to happen. And any UAV you do have already, if you have a, a Phantom or a, a Mavic or any of the Autels or any of those things uh, that are not already transmitting uh, that can be picked up for the USS and nobody's is right now because nobody knows what it is. And since your existing UAV or your RC airplane does not have that, you will not be able to fly. It will become obsolete unless you fly in a fixed site, which is eventually going to go away. They're gonna become less and less because they don't want you in this airspace. Remember what I talked about, the volume reservations. It's not about uh, hey, you old nasty drone guy, you wrecked it for the rest of us because of you were flying. That's just not it, right? This is about volume reservations. This is about control, 100% control of the airspace. And they need that space. And they can't have anything in that airspace that they don't know is there and can control. Because if that's the case, the entire traffic management system falls apart. They have to know exactly what's there. And if you're in it and not transmitting, you are rogue and potentially going to cause a safety hazard. So it just can't be. Sorry to say. So next is the equity section. And what equity means is what if uh, three people want to occupy the same volume reservation? What if you're doing a video of a waterfall and there is a gentleman who is doing a survey, uh, a commercial survey uh, for a construction company, and there is an automated delivery coming from UPS? Uh, how do they reconcile who's going to get the right of way for that airspace? They said, of course, there will be a, uh, an attempt for a flight plan adjustment that they will notify all the operators real time give them the opportunity to adjust their flight path, whether it's up or down, uh, out of this volume of airspace, uh, side to side, or in the fourth dimension, change the time of the flights uh, so that everybody can be accommodated within the airspace. However, when it comes down to an area where people need to be in this particular volume for whatever reason, 
uh, the FAA is going to reserve the right to make the final determination. Again, I'm afraid the hobbyist is going to lose when people start weighing who has a more important reason to be in that airspace. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be it. And most recently, of course, they're getting the general public involved. Now, this is where I believe it's crucial for the FAA to have the general public involved in this scenario because they can't police this by themselves. The local police aren't going to care. They're not going to be wandering around looking for drones. However, when the general public uh, sends a notification to a police department, uh, any local authority or a public safety entity, and they say that there's a UAV in the area that they're thinking might be up to no good, the general public becomes the arm of the FAA. And this is how they gain visibility uh, all over the US uh, in any piece of the airspace in every little uh, community uh, without actually having a physical FAA presence. And what the local authorities does with it. For instance, do they transmit it to the FAA? Uh, do they need to get the loop closed that way or not? Or do they follow up by themselves for a privacy call without the FAA having to do the actual work of regulating the airspace? Whew. So that is my two cents on the UTM report that just came out from the FAA. Of course, this is my interpretation of what I saw. I made a few links here between Remote ID and some of the industry happenings that have been going on. Uh, but of course, I want your comments. If you think I'm way off base or I've made a connection where there shouldn't be one, uh, or if you think, well, this isn't the way it's going to unfold, that isn't what it meant and I just plain missed it somewhere, uh, please let me know in the comments. I'm game. And between us, hopefully we can come up with what the real answer is so we can all be prepared and know what's going on in our own future being UAV pilots. So that's all I have for today. Uh, I hope it was useful to you. And if so, I appreciate a like always. And again, if you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do that. As there's more information, I will be sure to convey it uh, as quickly as I can. Uh, and if you're subscribed, you'll get a notification so you know that that's happening. With that, until next time, good flying.